I hereby uh, take the opportunity to welcome you back to the next session of the academic sessions conducted by the College of JP. To hold the uh, chair next for the next session, I cordially invite Dr. Dumindu Vijay Vardhana and Dr. Irandi Varkampai to come out to the main table, please. Uh, after tea, now we have an interesting lecture, The Forgotten Flu Influenza. Basics and beyond. So, I cordially invite Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka to the head table. Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka is a consultant pulmonologist, teaching hospital and district chest clinic, Ratnapura, Sri Lanka. He is a consultant pulmonologist with a special interest in pulmonary infections, pleural diseases, and pulmonary critical care. Dr. Niranjan Disanayaka is a fellow of the Ceylon College of Physicians and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, past joint secretary in 2015 and 2018 of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists and current council member, past council member of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. He's a member of the specialty board in respiratory medicine, postgraduate institute of medicine, University of Colombo, and an accredited postgraduate examiner. He's also a visiting lecturer and examiner for the Faculty of Medicine, University of Jayavardhanapura, and University of Sabaragama. He has been a resource person and speaker at various annual academic sessions and CME programs at several faculties, colleges, and institutions in Sri Lanka and overseas. Contribution to several research publications with special interest in respiratory infections, especially on tuberculosis and non-tuberculous mycobacteria. He has provided contribution towards various guidelines pertaining to respiratory medicine, Ministry of Health. Dr. Niranjan Nisanayake has been awarded a silver sponsorship by the European Respiratory Society for the study on non-tuberculous mycobacteria and nominated by the National Academy of Sciences, Sri Lanka, as a country representative and recognized by the Inter-Academy Medical Panel as a young physician leader in Berlin, 2014. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, chairpersons. Uh, President and the Council of the Sri Lanka College of uh, General Practitioners. It is indeed an honor uh, to be here amongst uh, yourselves uh, to discuss about a very interesting topic, but unfortunately has been swept under the carpet because of the new kid on the block, the SARS-CoV-2 virus or COVID-19. So let me take you back about 100 years back to 1918 to a small city called Kansas in United, United States of America in March where the first few cases of a typically unusual cause of flu was noted and the first mortalities were reported. And then by April this spread into the, the Europe, the Fra the France, and then it rapidly spread through the world, including Sri Lanka and Australia. Now, another type of catastrophe was brewing in this time period. That was the World War I, where many young men were recruited and were trained in crowded cramps and were sent into the front line to be in trenches at the mercy of the cold wind, malnutrition, and the many, many, many hazardous events that they had to face during the war. This recruitment drive, as well as this, the training drive, helped flu to develop into a pandemic because Train loads of recruits were traveling through, throughout the United, United States and then infecting the various areas that were, they were traveling. So these two catastrophes were going hand to hand. <clears throat> it is almost like the, the traveling as well as the COVID that, was, that had a similar picture in the recent uh, pandemic that we are facing now. Now, this virus, the influenza virus, is an automixo virus, which has four subtypes, four types of influenza virus. The, fortunately, 
affects only cattle. C causes mild infection in most of, uh, most of the immunocompetent adults. And B and A causes seasonal flu. Out of B only affects the humans, and it is rather less severe and less prone to get mutations. But influenza A is the major virus that causes significant comorbidities and comor comorbidities as well as deaths in majority of the people. And its potential, as it, as it is depicted here, to infect other animals like, you know, the fowl and the pig. So especially the pig has the receptors, the both receptors that can accept the avian viruses as well as the human viruses, making it a very good mixing uh, source. And hence, these viruses can develop abnormal mutations very rapidly, and hence the potential to cause pandemics that we know of today. So out of the four influenza types, influenza A and B are the most important viruses that causes disease in man to a significant effect. When we look at the structure of the influenza virus, you can see that there are eight strands of negative sense RNA, segmented RNA, enveloped in a protein, lipoprotein capsule. And there are important, three important proteins that I would like to highlight here, which will be interesting to understand, to understand the treatment as well as the pathogenicity of influenza viruses. One major protein is the hemagglutinin. Hemagglutinin, it's a surface protein in the influenza virus, which attaches itself to the salic acid residues in, which is present in almost all cells in the body, including red blood cells. And when it is attached to the red blood cell, it can cause coagulation or clotting of the red blood cell or coming together of the red blood cell, hence the name hemagglutinin. So when the salic acid residue and neuraminidase is conjected or taken into together, it facilitates the virus to enter into a live cell through the endosome process. And from the endosome, it, the M2 channel, ion channel protein, which is only there in influenza A virus, which is a more important target in amantidine, an antiviral that we use, helps them to put out the, the ribonuclear acids from the virus into the cell to facilitate producing of protein. And when the adequate amount of protein and genetic material are produced in the cell, the newly formed virions are now taken out from the cell and still they are attached to the ciliac acid residues. Then the neuroaminidase is a very important aspect that will help cleave the virus from the, uh, from the cell, helping it to go and infect another cell. Hence, hemagglutinin as well as neuroaminidase and M2 channel proteins are very important in the pathogenicity of influenza virus. And at the same time, it is very important, especially the hemagglutinin, is the antigenic properties of the influenza virus. Actually, the neutralizing antibodies in most instances, like the spike protein in the SARS-CoV virus, is produced against hemagglutinin. And any variation in the antigenic subunits of the influenza virus might render the antigenic response, antibody response, important to various influenza viruses. We have identified about 18 hemagglutinin types and about 11 neuraminidases type. So in combination, there can be around 182 HN subtypes, but in the, in the normal uh, nature, we have identified about 131. Some of them exclusively infect animals, some of them infect humans, and some had the potential to infect both humans as well as animals. 
Now, identifying and understanding the types of uh, influenza and the subtypes are very important, especially when we are dealing with some, when we are you know, reading literature and trying to understand the influenza viruses. So basically, of interest are the two influenza viruses, influenza A and influenza B, which can be divided into subtypes according to the H type and the N type that I told previously. And the two commonest subtypes that are now circulating among our populations are the H1N1 subtype, which is a pandemic one, 009, as well as the H3N2 subtype. And according to the, uh, the flu report by the MRI, I, I, could, I could only find the 2017 reports. In Sri Lanka, uh, we have an H3N2 predominance rather than H1N1 predominance. So the importance of having H3N2 rather than H1N1 is that out of these two subtypes, H3N2 has a more potential to create mutations than H1N1 subtypes. So in Sri Lanka, we have the commonly H3N2. And then it divides into clades where small genetic mutations can happen. But sometimes the antigenic uh, response can occur even though there are subclades in this group. Now, <clears throat> when we talk, look, talk about the influenza B type, now, same, uh, the flu report in Sri Lanka has said that around uh, about 55% is influenza B, 45% is influenza A, but it depends. So it, we might have a 50-50 influenza A and B co-infection uh, ratio in Sri Lanka at the moment, and it has mainly two lineages. It is not as complicated as the influenza A subtypes, and according to that, you have the clades. So the importance that we can understand in this uh, typing is that these viruses are very complex organisms. Even though they are very, very non-complex organisms, their, their immunogenicity, their mutation, the rapid mutation that they have can have significant consequences, especially when we are developing vaccines and especially uh, where, when we are facing this as a new virus. Now, when we name the influenza virus, mainly influenza A, what, how we name is that. Now, this, if you are looking at the, vac the, the vaccines and the subunits in a, in a leaflet, this is the way that the vaccine, the, the, the type of influenza subtype is demonstrated in the articles, where A is the virus type, which is A or B. Usually, the second part will be the host or the source. If it is human, you don't mention the source, but if it is an avian, you will say A, avian, or pig, or something like that. And then where it was isolated, it is Fijian, and then the strain number, the year of isolation, and the virus subtype that is there. And especially this subtype, the Fujian subtype, created a significant a localized epidemic pandemic type of a situation uh, in 2003, 2002. Region, because the the vaccine didn't cover this particular strain. The vaccine that, that was already developed didn't cover that strain. So, highlighting the importance of uh, keeping tab of the virus. Now we have undergone several pandemics uh, during the last centuries. The first reported one is uh, the Rish Russian pandemic, and then the Spanish flu, which was actually falsely named as Spanish flu because all the other countries censored the influenza. Uh, numbers because of the war. They didn't want to demoralize the population, but Spain was neutral and they allowed the media to report, including their king, the King Alfonso. So then the name came as Spanish flu, even though they were not the origin of the flu. And then we had various pandemics, as you can see, coming in uh, in various time periods of time, killing about 50 million in 1918, and then about 1 million in 1977. So it is a deadly disease that we have to face. Why do we have pandemics? Now, this influenza virus, as I told you, has, is a particular virus with a segmented RNA. It has its own RNA polymerase, which helps them to replicate. But unfortunately, this R RNA polymerase is a very, very poor proofreader. So the mutations that occur in the RNA 
elements, the what is uh, come out come as an outcome, cannot be usually corrected. So this can have, uh, you know, the the virus can die because of this, but they can have certain advantages of having increasing probability of infecting another person, especially if these small mutations that accumulate in time occur in the antigenic portions of the hemagglutinin protein, the, our immune system will not recognize this back, uh, the virus. That is the reason that every year we have to produce a new vaccine compared to the other vaccines like chickenpox, like the other viruses. So this antigenic shift, the small mutations, the point mutations that come every year rapidly happening because of this RNA polymerase not being able to identify this mutation is a cause and it helps the influenza vaccine to survive and it creates huge problems to us in containing this virus in the community. Another thing that can happen is that I told you previously that influenza can co-infect uh, some species together avian and pig, uh, avian and human, and in that source, these RNA can intermingle and create a completely new virus, which is completely a newcomer to the immune system, our immune system. The, our immune system even haven't seen the, seen the vaccine, uh, seen this virus partially. So then these patients can become severely ill and they can get the disease very easily than in a normal person. So these, the antigenic drift, this is called, antigenic shift, which is called like, uh, the, the, this is antigenic shift, can create problems in the normal immunocompetent population as well. Even though the antigenic drift, the small changes can cause problems in the immunocompromised. So when we look at, in 2000, 20 January, just before the COVID pandemic happened, uh, we can see at least about 21 to 30 percent uh, had been, in some, uh, the, the, the samples that were taken were positive during that region. So even in Sri Lanka, the, we have sentinel sites, and it, this has shown that analysis has shown that about 30 percent of the samples that we got from the severe acute respiratory illnesses as well as influenza-like illnesses were positive in Sri Lanka as well. But see how it has changed in March 2021, there's a significant drop in the number of influenza patients. So maybe our methods of protecting ourselves work to mitigate the propagation of influenza virus, but maybe because now the checking is more towards COVID and the COVID infected persons with COVID and influenza are not being identified, or the resources have been mainly targeted towards COVID rather than influenza might be one of the reasons for the reduction. But we clinically also see a number of influenza patients being reduced than high. Now in Sri Lanka, in OPD attendees, about two to three percent of the SARI or severe acute respiratory illness and influenza-like illnesses are, uh, have been identified. And we have two peaks, May to July and October to February, which usually correlates the monsoonal rain patterns. Until, unlike the temperate countries, we usually have a stable influenza ratio, but in certain time periods with the rain, it can increase and wax and wane. And in our Sri Lankan setting, female predominance were the, were the main thing that we have noted, 15 to 49, and the 50 to 64 age groups were identified and there were about 91 clinical suspected deaths in Sri Lanka in 2017. So basically when we look at the transmission, it is almost similar to the COVID virus. And uh, you can see that when we talk, when we cough, we, uh, we have three types of particles, the larger than 100 micrometer particles can drop near the podium and near you and form it and then when we touch and then we touch our faces, it can give the disease to us and to another person. And the other particles, the, the 5 to 100 particles, usually can be in the air for a certain time period, but it drops in the nearby, and it can give an aerosol-generated infection to another person when they breathe in. And the long airborne particles can be there when we have fine particles, especially after aerosol-generating procedures like bronchoscopy and induction of sputum. And hence, the main important thing even in influenza is to cover your cough clean frequently and contain your germs by staying home, right? But 
even though the virus has these particular virulence factors, not everyone will get the virus, and even if you get the virus, you, no, not everyone will be critically ill. So there are host factors, mainly pregnant women at any age of pregnancy, up to about two weeks postpartum, children aged six to five years, elderly individuals, mainly more than 50, 65, and importantly, patients with chronic medical conditions, mainly chronic lung diseases like bronchiectasis and COPD, and the patients with diabetes, chronic renal failure have a higher risk of progressing into disease and severe disease. And obviously the health workers are high risk of getting the disease because of the contacts that they have. And at the same time, they are at high risk of giving the disease to the other patients as well because of the close contact. Hence, they have identified it as a high risk group. Now, in the 2009 pa pandemic, I want to highlight the importance of the pregnant patients and protecting our pregnant ladies from this influenza virus because it's close to my heart as well. And uh, basically, they had more increased risk for severe disease, hospitalization, admission to the intensive care units. And their, the loss of fetus, the their children, were very higher than the normal population. And unfortunately, 5% of all deaths from the pandemic in the U.S. were in pregnant or postpartum uh, ladies, even though women represent only about 1% of the population. So we, we see that there is a higher risk of having severe disease of, in, because of influenza when we get it in pregnancy. And in Sri Lanka also we have noticed that, and unfortunately we have a very good maternal and child health care program in Sri Lanka, and our our, our numbers are very good, but unfortunately every year about 120 to 150 women die because, uh, during pregnancy and because of pregnancy related complications, out of which about one six, that is about 20, are due to respiratory causes. And when we analyze the respiratory causes, we see that half of them have been having proven influenza infection. So hence, out of these deaths, we see that at least we can prevent 10 deaths if we take the correct uh, methods of preventing these deaths from happening. And it is important that to stress that even though, especially in pregnant females, it is very important that we have to treat them within the first 48 hours because as I told you previously, the, the virus, the, most of the drugs prevents the virus from budding out from the cell and we have to treat them before that process occurs because most of the, these uh, drugs, are, uh, the neuroamandidase in the desaltamia will prevent the budding off of the virus. So we have to treat very rapidly that rate. Other than these virus features as well as the host features, we know that every illness has a social aspect. And unfortunately in most of the instances, especially in flu, social uh, people, where it's, where it's low socioeconomic states, we have seen that influenza deaths have been increased and the rates of influenza is high, especially because of the congestion, the lack of medical care, lack of insurance, poor health care access has been contributing towards the problem. So it is a virological, medical, as well as a sociological and economic factor. Now, when we compare the seasonal flu and the COVID-19, the RO, the, the reproductive number, can change depending on the situation. But usually, the, uh, the influenza has a low reproductive number. That is, the number of patients that you can infect uh, by a single person is low. It should be less than one to contain. But in the incubation period is over one to four days compared to one to 14 days in COVID. And you can shed the virus before symptoms occur about one day before in influenza and sometimes two days before in COVID. And hospitalization in flu in an immunocompromised paper are less than COVID. And the case fatality rate, fortunately in, uh, in COVID, we don't see the pregnant people being more affected, but the case fatality rate is very high in patients who are having chronic lung disease as well as in pregnant people. The clinical presentation of uh, influenza is very important to understand because any respiratory illness can mimic influenza, but the salient features are the high fever and generalized lethargy without significant amount of respiratory symptoms. So they usually present with high fever, significant amount of lethargy and headache with mild respiratory symptoms within the first two days compared to the other respiratory illnesses where you get a stuffy nose, sore throat earlier in the disease than late. 
and they can convert into viral pneumonia when the lower, lower cells are involved. And then the unfortunate thing is when this epithelium is damaged, this will cause a significant nidus to for that the bacteria can now come, come and play a role, mainly Streptococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Haemophilus influenza. We have seen people who are improving at day three and day four, and then again getting bad at day five and day six because of the severe cavitatory pneumonia that can have that can happen in Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. If we don't identify it early and treat with appropriate antibiotics early, then these patients can the have severe complications because of this bacteria. And if you are unfortunate, you can develop acute respiratory distress syndrome. So how in a clinical setup, in the GP setup or general practitioner setup, how we can differentiate basically whether it's a viral or a bacteria is rather difficult. But the patient who is coming with a typical myalgia, fever, headache with minimum respiratory symptoms or probably a dry cough with a low CRP, with a normal blood count and a chest x-ray showing these early reticular shadows with probably a lung being normal, then we have to suspect whether it is a pneumonia due to viral etiology. Especially in this context, we have to think about COVID-19 as well. And this can, co this can go on to develop into rapid pneumonia and the patient can develop into ARDS and die. These are the respiratory consequences, but they can have myocarditis. They have shown to have increased ischemic heart diseases. They can have encephalopathy. They can go into acute renal failure and many other complications because of pneumonia. And this is, shows a beautiful consolidation because of a secondary bacterial infection with nice air bronchobromes in the left and right lower zones. Right. So how will you diagnose if you suspect? This is the guideline issued by the the, uh, the MRI, you can put a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab in a viral transmode medium and send it to the MRI within 48 hours. And you can diagnose with RT-PCR, same as the COVID and antigen de detection by immunofluorescence and then virus isolation. Right, so we have basically three treatment options when you are treating uh, uh, influenza virus. One was amantadine. I, the reason that I told was was that because of the haphazard use of amantadine, unfortunately, even though it has only activity against influenza A, now about 90 to 95% of uh, the viruses are now resistant to amantadine, reducing its feasibility. So that is why I think when we try, we are thinking of treating influenza, we have to identify the people who will most benefit from the treatment and not treat everybody. Uh, with, uh, with antivirals. And the other one is Ozaltamavir, uh, the oral, we got, we call Tamiflu, oral, oral uh, formulation that is for five days. And then the Sanamavir, which is the, which is the inhaled form, and the Paramavir, which is the IV form, we, we inhibit the viral neuraminidase that I discussed earlier. And we have a new drug called Balaxavir in USA. It's a single dose uh, drug but it is effective against influenza B as well, especially in young patients. Uh, but it has not been to prove be effective in severe influenza, pregnant patients, and children less than 12 years. So the only drug that we have at the moment is Osaltamavir, which is very useful for us, but we have to use it very, very, very sparingly unless we will get resistant. There have been re you know, reported resistance to Osaltamavir as well, and we only have this drug at the moment in Sri Lanka. The doses are easy to remember, 75 milligrams two times daily for the treatment, and rarely, if you need prophylaxis, you have to give 75 milligrams for 10 days. Right. Again, highlighting the early treatment, this is because out of the 11 pneumonia deaths, due to HI, uh, the influenza, only, you can see that, um, only one was treated within four days of symptoms, ideally, in any pregnant female which we are suspecting of influenza, we have to admit the patient to a relevant ward and start oseltamia as early as possible after sending the viral studies without waiting for the viral report to come. So the early treatment is the must in, in, uh, in pregnant ladies as well as in immunocompromised patients. When you're talking about the vaccines, we have actually the live attenuated vaccine, the intranasal vaccine, which is there, which is usually recommended for two to 50 years uh, 
population, and then we have the whole vaccines, then the split vaccines, which has the subunits as well as the internal substances of the viruses, and then we have the recombinant subunit vaccine, which has the H and N uh, portions of that particular strain. And when we are talking about the strain of the influenza virus, we, the, the WHO have beautiful sentinel sites in whole worlds, and they recommend into the northern hemisphere as well as the southern hemisphere. So these are the 2021 recommendations for the northern hemisphere. And we are actually, we are the southern, we are, even though I think we are in the northern hemisphere, the recommendation is for southern hemisphere vaccines, unless you go to the temperate country for a holiday for more than three months. But basically, but the important thing is that we usually have a tetravalent or a trivalent vaccine. It has usually two A's and one B, and sometimes two Bs. So depending on the, the year, as well as where you are traveling and where you are staying, the vaccine will differ, because or, or else there will be no efficacy of the vaccine. So flu prevention is similar to the COVID prevention. Keep hands clean, cover the mouth, don't touch your face, right? Keep happy, eat healthy, exercise, and if you are ill, stay at home. Not very different from the COVID. And things are not very different from COVID as well. Now, if you look at these uh, photographs, right, and if you, you know, change the hairstyle, right, change the attire, and if you are looking at it in color, these, the same pictures we have seen enough times during the past one year. The same pictures we have seen. So we are seeing a similar picture. Even we had they, Prophet Dr. Fossey as well, right? So this is a, a Washington epidemiologist who took, into the, took the matters into his hand to prevent people from suffering. And he actually had decreased, uh, published in papers by his own to prevent this from happening. But at the same time, like now, we had the anti-maskers gathering against him. And at the same time, they were defy, you know, they, 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 they didn't, uh, they markedly objected what Dr. Tuttle said. So history, we say that it's a very good teacher. It's a great teacher. But the important thing is, and it, it teaches us lessons, ladies and gentlemen. But the important thing is, do we learn from them? Because whether we learn from the history or not, we'll probably decide whether homo sapiens will survive another 100 years or more. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, so far, we don't have uh, any questions from online participants. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. So, Dr. Brady, yes, sir. Can I ask you right now, are we in northern and southern hemisphere? What's the vaccine we get? Um, so the basically what we have to use is the, is the recommended form is a southern vaccine if you are staying in Sri Lanka. Let How me, is that sorry? It yeah, it is there. So usually there are some companies who, it's in the private sector. Uh, so they usually bring the vaccine usually around April uh, because uh, what they, how they decide what type of a vaccine is suitable for a country is by, this is by analyzing, the, analyzing the subtypes of the viruses. So the WHO has sentinel sites throughout the world, and in Sri Lanka also we have sites. We send data to the WHO, and depending on that, they predict the type of influenza strain that can happen in the, sorry, in the next year. So according to that prediction, they produce the vaccines, the two types of vaccines. And uh, in Sri Lanka, we actually, it is the recommendation is to go use the southern hemisphere vaccine if you are in Sri Lanka. But if you are planning to travel to the temperate countries at the United Kingdom and uh, USA, at least about uh, six weeks before, you might have to, at least two, at least two weeks before, according to you have to take the vaccine as well. And which part of the uh, year do you recommend? El Dila particular, sir, I think the most important part is because we will have the first one, monsoon wave by May. May to, so that, that is when we will usually get a peak. Except in 2017, 2017 was a rather bizarre year because we had a peak around March, April as well. But usually it starts in May. So by April, if we can vaccinate our population, at least the elderly population, that will be the best, I think. 
At the moment, uh, it is in the private sector. We, 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 from, uh, in my, for my patients, especially with COPD and chronic lung disease, I recommend that. And uh, we tried to uh, you know, get the approval for the pregnant population in Sri Lanka. Uh, due to the concerns that we all have had, this, the, on, not only the deaths, but the loss of uh, the loss of children, or that is loss of uh, and the suffering that the patients uh, that had to undergo with ICU stays, the near misses, so everything with the pregnancy, I think uh, we should at least uh, think about uh, vaccinating our pregnant population. Uh, at the moment, uh, the there is no such recommendation, unfortunately. We have, <laughs> we have, uh, but uh, there had been a there had been a report in 2018 uh, not recommending uh, the uh, influenza vaccine for the pregnant population for the EPI, but uh, they don't. Uh, but even uh, there's a beautiful segment in the SLMA uh, by Dr. Professor uh, Dr. Dujud Jayamaha regarding influenza vaccine, uh, the SLMA vaccination booklet. So in there, he recommends it to the pregnant people. So if, you, if a person can afford, uh, if, if it is, uh, it's not very expensive as well. It's not very expensive. Influenza vaccine, I think, is about 1,500 to 2,000 rupees. So I think we can, you should recommend, and at the higher level, we should push for uh, vaccination. Yes. Yes. What I'm saying is it correct or the problem is now as now I had the 2000 data uh, for, for you to show, but basically they have reported about 91 deaths uh, that can be attributed to influenza in Sri Lanka, but I think that there's probably an underdiagnosis and reported. not reported and possibly because now even in the Sentinel sampling. Uh, we sample about five uh, severe acute respiratory infections and then about 10 uh, influenza-like infections to get an idea. And out of these samples, about 30% are positive. So probably we have a higher burden of influenza. And sometimes probably the patients after the primary viral infection come with a secondary bacterial infection to us. So that might mask the primary diagnosis that the mortality is moderate morbidities because of influenza. So fortunately at the MRI, they have improved the diagnostic facilities thanks to our virologists who have been appointed uh, there. But because of the COVID, I'm not very sure whether these facilities are you know, functioning smoothly at the moment. Thank you, sir, for the, <laughs> thank you for the informative lecture. Uh, now I cordially invite uh, Dr. Eranti Valgampaya to uh, hand over a token of appreciation.